it's really a uh, career-long pleasure for me to lead a very talented group of multidisciplinary scientists and clinicians who come at Kawasaki disease and look at it through a number of different lenses. In the lecture uh, at noon today, if any of you are able to come, I'll be talking more about our bench research, but today I'm really going to talk about our clinical efforts, and this is my lab group at UCSD, <clears throat> where we have a, a broad variety of, of different trainees working with us. So I wanted to make sure that you understood the setting in Japan, because I think Americans are not so aware of the epidemic proportions of Kawasaki disease in Japan, and I liken it to autism. So the rate of Kawasaki disease in Japan is the same as the rate of autism in this country. So one in every 60 boys and one in every 75 girls in Japan will develop Kawasaki disease during the first 10 years of their life. And I think these are facts that are not well known. This is unpublished data um, communicated to me by Kazu Nakamura, who's the head uh, epidemiologist for Japan. So this is what the epidemic curve looks like, and there are obviously some very interesting uh, parts of this landscape, which include, uh, maybe I don't have this, there we go, uh, which include these nationwide epidemics. So Japan began recording information here uh, in the late 1960s, early 70s, and then there were these huge nationwide ep ep epidemics, and you can see that the epidemic curve has continued. So the rate now is 300 cases per 100,000 children, less than five. We did some historical investigations with teams at Tokyo University and really went back through very moldy archives trying to find the first cases of Kawasaki disease. And I think everyone in the field, at least everyone in the field in Japan, agrees that this is a new disease after World War II. So if you're interested in being Sherlock Holmes, um, that's one of your clues about what Kawasaki disease is, new disease after World War II. So I wanted to share with you the statistics that we have from that little place south of you on the Mexican border called San Diego County. We're much smaller than you are, a population base of 3.2 million. And our numbers are very different from Japan. We have a monopoly of pediatric care at Rady Children's Hospital. Um, so there are about 100 new cases per year in our community. A couple of those are at Balboa, the military hospital, a couple of them in the Kaiser system. And this translates into one in every 2,000 children will develop KD in San Diego County. These are our statistics from our hospital. So you're looking at raw numbers of Kawasaki disease patients that we care for. These are not patients coming in from Mexico or anywhere else. These are <clears throat> domestic uh, local kids. And we see between 80 and 90 new patients a year. These are the statistics for uh, the hospitals that are registered in the Pediatric Health Information Service. And uh, Los Angeles here, I'm sorry, represents Children's Hospital of LA, I apologize. But um, th they're the only hospital uh, from the LA area that are actually in the FIS database. Um, so the blue bars are uh, San Diego here. These blue bars are San Diego. And uh, this is CHLA and then other hospitals, as you see along the West Coast. So why do we have so much Kawasaki disease in San Diego? Um, people have come up with lots of hypotheses. One, I'm there and I'm over-diagnosing Kawasaki disease. It's possible, uh, although I think unlikely. Um, and uh, the other reason has to do with research that we're doing on uh, wind patterns that come over from Asia. And I won't be talking about that specifically today, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. So if you break down our Kawasaki disease population by uh, race, ethnicity, you can see that our Asian population in any year that you want to choose with the green bars are overrepresented. And as well, our very small in San Diego County African American population, but in other centers such as Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C., and Detroit, where there's a larger African-American population, they are clearly genetically predisposed to this disease. And we have the first um, paper on the genetic susceptibility of African-Americans uh, coming out uh, uh, later this month. <clears throat> 
I regret to say that I've been showing this slide for about the last 20 years. I just changed the uh, year at the top. So it seems like we're not making a lot of progress because I'd like to be able to replace that environmental trigger. I have changed it, however. It used to say infectious agent and it now says environmental trigger. But the idea is that the world is divided into genetically susceptible and resistant hosts and the immunologic reaction that a susceptible host makes is what we recognize as Kawasaki disease. So many agents have been uh, candidates for the cause of Kawasaki disease. So far, there's nothing on the table. And I think our studies of the immunology of this disease that I'll be talking a little bit more about at the noon lecture really lead us to believe that this is probably not an infectious agent. That hurts because my background, of course, is in pediatric uh, infectious disease and molecular virology specifically. So I really wanted this to be a virus, but I think I have to accept the data um, that's before me. So obviously, we are all concerned in this audience about treating these children to avoid this complication. Here are the coronary artery aneurysms. This is the normal caliber of the artery. Here's the large aneurysm, easy to see in the subtracted view. And of course, the calcification that occurs both at the inlet and the outlet of the aneurysms is uh, a great risk for thrombosis in these. And this is actually from our adult KD study. This is the gentleman who presented with an acute MI, not knowing that he had had missed Kawasaki disease in childhood. So you see these huge aneurysms are great risk for thrombosis. And the only solution to this really is to be better pediatricians to treat these patients in a timely manner and try to prevent this problem. So we've got the red flags of Kawasaki disease. I'm sure you're all familiar, at least superficially, with the clinical diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. And it is still a clinical diagnosis. And one of our uh, residents told me that house staff are now using this mnemonic to remember the signs of Kawasaki disease. So I was glad after working on the disease for 30 years that someone finally taught me a mnemonic. Um, for it. So we've got crash and burn. Okay, so if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, maybe you can take away crash and burn so you'll remember what you're looking for. The conjunctival injection, the rash, the adenopathy, strawberry tongue. I, it would have been nice if they worked in the lips here, but I guess that didn't fit well with crash. And the uh, hands and feet uh, with the changes that you see there. So I'm really going to delve into the details, the nitty gritty of how we make the diagnosis of this disease. And for me, one of the most powerful teaching tools has been the mistakes that I've made. And I can promise you that over the last 30 years, I've made a number of mistakes in diagnosing this disease. So not all of the mistakes that I'm going to show you today are mine personally. I will not take ownership of all of these. But uh, they are mistakes that were made by uh, well-trained clinicians uh, most of them in our hospital in San Diego. So we want to try to avoid this kind of publicity. So we're going to go through a list of all the things that belong in a differential diagnosis. When you see each of these entities that we're going to talk about, you need to have Kawasaki disease in the differential diagnosis of that entity. And it really is true that if you don't have KD in your differential, you just will forget about it and you will miss it. And so let's go through these concrete examples. Again, these are all real cases and real world situations. And here's the first one. So bacterial lymphadenitis. Child comes in with a unilateral large node. They flunked outpatient antibiotic treatment. And I think in this patient, your gaze goes pretty quickly over to these uh, red crack lips. And I don't think anybody's going to miss this diagnosis. But here's a baby who sat on our ward receiving IV clindamycin for a week. And you notice that the conjunctiva are very clear. And how does this baby have Kawasaki disease? Well, the eyes were red. But while she was getting her antibiotics, that resolved because, again, this is a self-resolving clinical picture. So here's her giant uh, lymph node here. Okay, you can see this unilateral node. 
And she did not have bacterial lymphadenitis. She had Kawasaki disease, where the other signs were missed. And John Kenegai, who is one of our emergency room <coughs> physicians in San Diego at Rady Children's Hospital and one of our KD team members, has written what I think is the definitive paper on this lymph node first presentation of Kawasaki disease. And again, if you see a child with fever and a large lymph node and it's not responding to outpatient antibiotics, you must have Kawasaki disease in your differential diagnosis. There are some signs and some, some pearls that are uh, in this paper about how to differentiate early KD before everything blossoms from uh, bacterial lymphadenitis, and they have a higher SED rate, and the appearance on ultrasound is actually quite characteristic. So when you look at that big node mass, it looks like a single big honker node there, but it's not. In fact, when you do ultrasound, you see that it's multiple, multiple nodes. So we call this cluster of grapes. I'm not sure they really look like grapes, but we'll call it that. And this is the large hypoechoic node of a bacterial lymphadenitis. This probably needs the surgeons to go in and drain it. So ultrasound can help you. Uh, CT is more elegant. It's a lot more radiation. Uh, and again, we're showing the same thing here. This is a different patient. But here are these clustered nodes forming this large lymph node mass here that feels like a single thing when you palpate it from the outside, but it's not. It's actually made up of a lot of nodes. Now, who are these nodes? This is the jugulodigastric node and that anterior cervical chain that drains the posterior pharynx. So something, we believe, is coming in through the upper airway and draining to these regional lymph nodes. This is bacterial lymphadenitis. We would all be dead if we had lymph nodes that were filled like this. And obviously, immunodeficiency patients can have lymph nodes that are all filled with bacteria. But when you get a bacterial infection, it's almost always a single hypoechoic node. And that's the hallmark of bacterial lymphadenitis as opposed to KD. So let's go to our next mistake, viral meningitis. We're in enterovirus season now in Southern California. You're going to be seeing these babies coming in, often infants with high fevers, maybe with a rash. And as far as I know, this is the only um, paper that's been published doing a survey of the CSF characteristics of Kawasaki disease versus enterovirus. So now, this was published by one of my students in 1998, so before we had available enteroviral PCR uh, on the spinal fluid, which obviously is going to bail you out a lot of the time. But I want to point out some features of the, the CSF findings in KD. So um, in the, this series, about 40% had a CSF pleocytosis. Virtually nobody had an elevated, uh, it had a depressed uh, glucose, and few of the patients had a modest elevation in CSF protein. So I think those are the characteristics that will help you, at least on the initial survey of the spinal fluid, to differentiate KD, the infant with rash and fever as their early signs of KD versus uh, enterovirus, which will be more likely to give you an elevated CSF protein. But of course, it depends on timing. Now you have PCR, but you need to think about it. Think about the other aspects of the laboratory values in Kawasaki disease as well. They have markedly elevated SED rates. At least 60% uh, of the patients in this series seen within the first 10 days after onset of fever had a SED rate greater than 60. So already you're putting yourself in a not so viral category. They've got anemia for age. They've got elevated white cell counts. About half of them have an elevated platelet count even within the first 10 days. So again, not bone marrow suppression, but bone marrow activation. Um, we're very interested in GGT and what it may be telling us about oxidative stress, not your gallbladder, but oxidative stress. Um, and again, we found that to be very helpful in evaluating these patients. Um, and this is a different profile than you would expect to see in enteroviral meningitis. So you also have to be a good clinician and examine the child and recognize that, yes, there's a rash that could be enterovirus. I wouldn't dispute that. But these lips are very red, and that is generally not part of uh, enteroviral disease. 
and here is the strawberry tongue. So I don't know if you have the same problem here in Los Angeles, but our house staff have very wonderful and wild concepts of what a strawberry tongue is. So let's, let's uh, make sure everybody's on the same page here. It's actually a specific injury pattern. It happens at the dermal epidermal junction, and it is sloughing of these uh, the tips of these filiform papillae that you see here that form the gray lawn on your tongue. And when there's an injury, those are sloughed off. It looks like a toxin response. Uh, and the fungiform papillae, shown here, these deep dermal structures, persist. And those are the seeds of the strawberry, OK? Interestingly, in Latin America, it's called a raspberry tongue. So it, it can be various fruits in various countries. But the idea is that you've got this dermal epidermal junction uh, injury. These tips have all sloughed off. And you have this very flat, red, glossy surface with these fungiform papillae. So important to use our words correctly. And when you use your words correctly and you really see a strawberry tongue, now not 100% of KD patients have this injury pattern. But when they do, you have a very limited differential diagnosis. And, and I think we, we tend to forget this. So if you see a strawberry tongue and a rash, your choices are bacterial toxin-mediated disease. So this could be scarlet fever. It could be toxic shock. It could be KD. If you have a strawberry tongue and conjunctival injection, I would suggest that scarlet fever drops off of the list, and you now have staph toxin disease, or KD. And that is a very small differential diagnosis. Now, this is not when you want to be making the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. But in our clinic, every month, we get one or two patients who are referred to us from the emergency room, from the dermatologist, from somebody who are presenting at this stage of the disease. So this is the very classic periungual peeling. It begins in a distribution right under the nail bed here. This toe is already peeled. You can see it, the peel coming off here. And uh, it's a full thickness epidermal peel. Um, in an older child, it's more dramatic. It's more subtle in an infant. And then when you really don't want to be seeing the patient is when they present with this characteristic finding of the nails called Bose lines. Now, this is nonspecific. This can happen after any major inflammatory trauma. You may see Bose lines. But we use it as part of our Sherlock Holmes investigation when we get kids being referred to us with the query of missed Kawasaki disease. So I carry a, the house staff tease me because I carry a magnifying glass in my pocket and I uh, go searching for these transverse grooves. So this, of course, was uh, the part of the nail that was being formed during the acute inflammatory insult. So this is about six weeks out from their acute Kawasaki disease. All right, let's talk about culture-negative UTI in infants. Right. So Hiroko Shike uh, in our group many years ago did a study looking at these white cells in the urine. And can you have white cells in the urine of children with, who are febrile controls, not with a urinary tract infection, but just children with fever? And the answer is yes. And the, the punchline from this paper published a long time ago in Pediatric Infectious Disease is that 80% um, of the Kawasaki disease patients had uh, a sterile pyuria, but so did uh, half of the febrile control subjects. But I want to point out to you something very interesting about these cells in the urine. You know, if you do a dipstick, you have that little square called WBC or leukocytes, depending on which dipstick you use. And that actually is testing. It's bursting white cells in the urine with the little uh, felt pad. And they are releasing an enzyme if they're polys, if they're neutrophils. They're releasing an enzyme called leukocyte esterase. That's very specific for polys, and that little pad <clears throat> will turn color. However, these are the cells in the urine in Kawasaki disease. These are mononuclear cells. Jane Neuberger and I actually filed a patent about 100 years ago, thinking this was going to be the diagnostic test for Kawasaki disease. And then it turns out that febrile controls have them too, so that didn't work. But uh, it's interesting that these are mononuclear cells. Some of them have these really bizarre and wild 
uh, intracellular inclusions, these, these cytoplasmic inclusions, this robin eggs blue, this is with a, a pap smear actually. But if you want to know what the cells are that the lab is reading in your urine, call up the lab and say, please do a cytospin prep and send it through the right gene sustainer, just like a CBC. And they'll send it through just like a blood smear, and they can do a cell count. They can do a differential on it. And if you're seeing no uh, color on the leukocyte esterase dipstick, but you're being told that there are lots of white cells in the urine, those are uh, characteristic of Kawasaki disease. So just remember, these are the cells in Kawasaki disease are not neutrophils. They're these mononuclear cells. All right, systemic allergic reaction with fever. So um, there are many allergists in the audience here, and I am not an allergist. But I think uh, most of us in the audience uh, would easily recognize that this is not Kawasaki disease. This is a systemic allergic reaction. Uh, this was to an antibiotic. Uh, so what are the features that, that help us immediately discard Kawasaki disease in our differential diagnosis. Um, one of them is the fact that if you could get this child to open his mouth, which was difficult, there are intraoral ulcers in there. And this degree of uh, swelling and involvement of the uh, vermilion border is not characteristic of KD. Um, and in addition to that, he had a brilliant conjunctivitis, which is difficult to see because he's so photophobic with his terrible keratitis that he won't open his eyes. Um, but again, uh, that degree uh, of involvement with exudate and tearing is not characteristic of our KD patients. And the rash of Kawasaki disease, although it can be many things, it is never bullous. It is never, frankly, bullous. So if you see bulli, you can cross Kawasaki disease off your differential list. Reactive arthritis after a febrile illness. I am very unhappy to say that I just came from m and with our orthopedics group, where they had been referred a child following a febrile illness who uh, came in not walking to the emergency room. And no one bothered to get a really great history of the antecedent febrile illness, but they thought this was uh, some kind of reactive arthritis, but she's not walking, and so we better call ortho, and ortho came and did what ortho does, which is take her to the operating room and tap the hip. But if anybody had bothered, they would have seen that she was peeling her fingertips. She had had Kawasaki disease, and a reactive arthritis following Kawasaki disease is common. This is uh, the knee of one of our patients, who, which has been tapped. You can see the telltale holes. And this is not a new uh, concept. So in her review paper in 1982, Marian Mellish, and uh, working with Raquel Hicks in uh, Honolulu, described this arthritis, which uh, at that time she thought the large joint arthritis was seen in 35 to 40 percent of patients. Um, I'm not sure we see it that much now because we treat these patients with IVIG. So remember, this was in an era where there was no gamma globulin treatment. So left to their own devices, uh, 40 percent of the patients are going to develop this kind of reactive arthritis. And the cell counts are dramatic. So you can't use the cell count to uh, say that this is or isn't uh, an acute infectious arthritis, but what you can do is take a history. And uh, I know we're all trained to do that. We sometimes forget. Okay, adenovirus infection. This, I think, for us clinically in the current era is our most problematic differential diagnosis. And the problem comes from the fact that the children with adenovirus do get conjunctival injection. But remember the pathophysiology of what's happening in acute adenovirus infection. These are kids who actually have replicating virus in the superficial epithelial cells of the conjunctiva. So what does that do? That creates an immune response. It creates cells going in there, therefore exudate or at least tearing. And it causes edema in the conjunctiva, which becomes redundant and folds over, if you will, the limbus, which is an anatomic structure that you see very clearly in this Kawasaki disease patient. 
So here's the limbus right here. This is where the clear conjunctiva tacks down to the underlying sclera, and it's relatively avascular. So if the conj is sitting flat on top of the sclera, you can actually see the limbus. And this is an artist's rendition, a little bit exaggerated, of, of how this works. But uh, the idea is that the limbus is here, the conjunctiva is lying flat. The conjunctiva is not lying flat if you have allergic reaction or a viral infection. So enterovirus, adenovirus, measles, anything you want that's actually replicating in the superficial epithelial cells, you will get redundancy and that conjunctiva will fold over and you will obscure the limbus. So the other thing you can do is get your friendly pediatric ophthalmologist. It has to be a pediatric person who is used to dealing with angry, uncooperative two-year-olds. Uh, the adult people will just run in the other direction. Um, but a pediatric ophthalmologist can go in with a slit lamp and see the mild anterior uveitis that is present in about 80% of our patients. It is by and large self-resolving. It doesn't require specific treatment. You don't need to put topical steroids into these patients. Um, but it is helpful in making the differential diagnosis. Anterior uveitis is not associated with adenoviral infection, but what the ophthalmologist can see is uh, what are called keratitic precipitates, KPs, uh, which are in the cornea, and they're actually little neutrophilic microabscesses that they can see uh, with the slit lamp uh, when they do their exam, and that is diagnostic of adenovirus. Now, of course, we have PCR, and you say, well, this is silly, you know, why be a clinician? Let's just send the lab test. And the problem is that in one study uh, using PCR in Taiwan, these are the rates of PCR positivity in patients who had a clinical verified diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. All right. So now that we're in the era of everybody doing uh, viral PCRs, we're beginning to understand, one, that there's viral asymptomatic carriage, okay? There's viral shedding that may go on for months, even in the upper respiratory tract, um, after acute infections that were antecedent. And in this series from Japan, if half of the patients who are being diagnosed with Kawasaki disease, presumably by reliable people who are interested in and uh, knowledgeable about this disease, if as many as half of them have uh, adenovirus positive PCR, that's a problem. And here's San Dominguez's data uh, from Colorado, 40% uh, uh, had adenovirus RSV um, uh, or herpes viruses. So it, it can be a problem. So uh, Pretty Jaggi, who's our collaborator at Nationwide in uh, Columbus, Ohio, I think has given us a very useful pearl that I suggest you use when trying to sort out in your adenovirus positive patient, is this really Kawasaki disease? And what uh, Priti did was she worked with the lab doing the PCR amplifications, and she showed that in real adenovirus, um, when you look at the cycle number where your amplification plot crosses the threshold and therefore is called positive, that in Kawasaki disease patients who were also adeno-PCR positive, the cycle number was about 36. So they were crossing the line and quote unquote becoming positive way out here. So this takes a little work on your part. You have to actually walk to the lab that does your PCR and talk with the technicians and ask to see the plot. And you're asking for the C sub T where the uh, PCR amplification plot crosses the line. They have these data. They can share it with you. They'll be delighted that you even cared. And if you have real adenovirus, just because of the burden of uh, template available for the reaction, you get a much more robust response and the uh, amplification plot crosses the line much earlier at a much lower cycle number. So you may not be PCR experts, but the people who run these PCRs for you are, and they will be happy to uh, share this information with you and this may be helpful. So now we kind of come to uh, a very personal part of the lecture, which is prolonged fever without a source in a young infant. So uh, this is one of my first papers on Kawasaki disease that was published in, I think that says 1986. Uh, 
And I really wrote this paper about these less than six month olds to in some way expiate the guilt for having missed the diagnosis in virtually all of these patients. So my first Kawasaki disease patient was a little baby who came in after 21 days of fever. She was referred from Wyoming to the hospital uh, where I was training in Colorado uh, at the uh, Denver Children's Hospital. And about six hours after doing the uh, consult to establish that she had Kawasaki disease, of course, we had no treatment in those days. Uh, she died. And this is the heart-lung block from her autopsy. And here are the aneurysms beaded on the surface of her heart. So uh, this was a very dramatic case. Um, it was uh, a real helpless feeling to make this diagnosis and not be able to save this baby. And this is the cross-section of her artery where you can see a very characteristic lesion of Kawasaki disease where you've got a muscular artery and you've got a very normal, well-preserved <clears throat> architecture here with the media, this nice internal elastic lamina here, and then, uh-oh, it goes off into oblivion here, you've got breaks, and it's filled in with what is probably, uh, probably was thrombus that has now uh, been reorganized and uh, you see even some recanalization uh, of a little portion of this fibrous material that has completely occupied uh, the vessel. So here's the normal internal elastic lamina, and then it goes off into oblivion. So characteristic pattern. So uh, all of these patients uh, <clears throat> had uh, bad outcomes. Uh, this is another patient whom I actually saw as an infectious disease fellow and followed this patient for the six weeks of her illness until she died without making the diagnosis. Uh, she presented at one point with this very weird rash on her face. We called Bill Weston, who is the head of dermatology, and he had diagnosed her with psoriasis. And we said, well, that kind of doesn't explain the fever. And of course, if you look at this today, you go, Dr. Burns, how could you miss this diagnosis? Look at this baby. But um, we didn't know a lot about this disease then. And here are her, her feet. And you say, well, this is Kawasaki disease. How could you miss the diagnosis? But we did. And this is how she ended her life, with myoentomal proliferation of all four arteries leading to her extremities. And she basically clotted off all four of her extremities and obviously expired shortly after this. So it's now 30 years later, and uh, my colleague, my, my junior trainee, mentee, uh, Winnis Tom, has just published this paper on the complication of psoriasis in Kawasaki disease. So this is what we do in academic medicine. When we make mistakes, when we miss diagnoses, we study it, we figure it out, and we publish it. So here you are 30 years later, we finally have a, a very uh, lovely description that Winnis and her fellows did um, of the, the problem of uh, severe uh, psoriasis in the early um, uh, subacute phase of Kawasaki disease that completely resolves. So this baby that you see here um, is actually now a beautiful three-year-old with absolutely no scarring. And what's very interesting about the psoriasis that happens after Kawasaki disease, obviously there's some genetic links here, but the Kawasaki disease does not come back. So these children do not develop chronic psoriasis. Uh, sorry, the psoriasis doesn't come back. Fortunately, the Kawasaki disease doesn't either. Um, so this was my uh, final paragraph from that paper. And I just want you to look at the last sentence, which says, the possibility of Kawasaki disease should be considered in young infants with unexplained fever, even if the clinical presentation is atypical. And in the uh, 2004 AHA guidelines, we put essentially that sentence in there that says, please get an echocardiogram on every infant with prolonged fever in whom you can't figure out the diagnosis, get an echocardiogram and see if that helps you out. And that sentence will also be there in the new 
2016 guidelines, which uh, have gone through all of the regulatory approvals, et cetera, et cetera, and I think will be presented at the AHA meetings uh, in New Orleans uh, this fall. So inspired by this very severe disease in these very young infants and the problem of missing the diagnosis, we wanted to study this again. So Andre Tremolay, um, my junior colleague at the research center, has taken on this study. Uh, these are not yet published data. Uh, we hooked up with the group at uh, uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County, Nagara Shuri, and together we pooled our data and we ended up with 88 children, 88 infants, less than six months of age. The majority were male. Uh, again, an interesting genetic story about Kawasaki disease. Uh, these were all under six months. And contrary to the urban myth that these patients are always missed and have terrible outcomes because they're treated late, not so, at least not so for the missed part, 86% of these patients were treated appropriately with IVIG right on time, within the first 10 days of illness. So how did they do? Uh, the median illness day was six, so not different from our older children. Um, and this concept that they're more likely to present with incomplete KD really depended on the center. So at our center, it was not true. They were not more likely to be incomplete KD. Um, at Children's Hospital of Orange County, where there are a variety of different people from different specialties making the diagnosis, uh, it was uh, more likely to be true. But here's the real take home message. Here is how these children did or didn't do. Despite the fact that they were treated within the first 10 days after fever onset, and now you're looking at data just from our center because uh, Children's Hospital of Orange County was not using Z scores. I hope you are all using Z scores. And uh, here are the data. If you're under six months of age, despite appropriate diagnosis and treatment, 8% of our children had giant aneurysms. 13% had significant aneurysms that uh, are a manifestation of absolutely irreversible, permanent, for the rest of their life, damage to the coronary artery. And, and let me say a word about that. I hope no one in this audience will use the, we call it the H word, when you describe to a parent the remodeling that can happen in these very young patients where if you do a luminogram, you're just looking at the lumen of the vessel, it comes back to a more normal diameter. We don't want to use the healing word because healing connotes to the parent, and I think in your own mind, gives you the sense of complacency that things are now fine. And having been involved with our adult Kawasaki disease team, so again, if you come across adults who have had Kawasaki disease, who would like some expert care, we have a team of adult cardiologists, including an interventional cardiologist in San Diego, who are now specializing in the care of adults with aneurysms following Kawasaki disease. And I can tell you, this is not a pretty story. Based on data from Japan and our own experience, 80% of these patients who have had aneurysms at any point in the course of their Kawasaki disease will require interventions as adults. So the fact that the bad stuff doesn't happen on our watch does not mean that these patients are okay. Any patient with an aneurysm ever, despite whether or not it's remodeled, must have lifelong, well-informed cardiovascular care. And this population of infants are particularly vulnerable. So we are not satisfied with IVIG for the treatment of this population. I'm going to be talking much more in the noon lecture about future directions and where I think we could go. At the moment, it seems that the general approach to these patients is to wring your hands 
and follow serial echocardiograms when you see these aneurysms and be very distraught and you're so sorry and put them on systemic anticoagulation when they hit a z-score of 10. But there's really no focused treatment to stop the progression of the aneurysms. And we're better than that. We, we have uh, things that we can do to uh, address this problem. And uh, this is from a, a paper that I hope will soon come out in Arthritis and Rheumatism, uh, a review that we did uh, where we imagine the architecture, normal architecture of the uh, coronary artery wall to be something like this with nice fat endothelial cells sitting here and an organized internal elastic and external elastic lamina, and here's the adventitia. And in Kawasaki disease, there are a number of targets that we can think about hitting. Here are the endothelial cells undergoing endo-MT, so endothelial to mesenchymal transition. They're becoming the evil my myofibroblast, which in this condition is not a healing good cell. It's actually a pro-inflammatory cell. And again, I'll be talking more about that at noon. But these uh, cells are making uh, matrix metalloproteinases, which are destroying the glue in the vessel here. Uh, they are secreting IL-17, so they're actively recruiting uh, neutrophils into the wall. These are the early responders, and monocytes uh, follow after. We've got IL-1 beta as a potential target. We've got dying endothelial cells liberating IL-1 alpha, so again, another potential target. So uh, lots of thoughts about how we could begin to interrupt this process when our echo tells us that this whole scenario is unfolding in the coronary artery. So Audrey Tremolay is our clinical trialist who is running these trials. Uh, we have a phase one, two-way trial of anakinra to target both the IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta. Uh, this is uh, open for enrollment for children eight months and older. Uh, we're testing safety, tolerability, PK, and the anti-inflammatory uh, effect of a two to six week course. You can get into the study if you're in the right age and you have a coronary artery Z score greater than three. We have uh, four subjects enrolled so far. We've had some very dramatic positive results, so we're optimistic and excited. Uh, there is also a phase one, two A uh, study for two year old and older children. We're collaborating with uh, Colorado Children's Hospital and the group there. Uh, and in the previous study, we're collaborating with Boston Children's Hospital. Um, this study is funded uh, by the NIH and uh, we are cruising along through uh, this study with 22 subjects enrolled. We've completed the PK part that's now under analysis. And I'm going to be talking about why the choice of anakinra and atorvastatin in the uh, noon uh, uh, lecture. So we'll go into more details. But these studies are open. Uh, we certainly welcome any questions that you have about these therapies. And uh, in closing, I wanted to make you aware of our website where if you have parents who speak any of these languages, this is a website that's used all over the world. Um, so if they happen to be uh, Malay or Ukrainian, uh, you can get them a Kawasaki handout in their own language here. And finally, uh, there's a video on YouTube called Kawasaki Disease A Parent Guide. We uh, wrote the script and worked with the LA filmmaker parent KD Parents, who uh, created this, uh, it was uh, paid for by the KD Foundation, and I really recommend it uh, for your medical students, trainees, and particularly for your parents as a reliable source of information. So thank you for your attention. It was an honor to be here today. Happy to take questions. <laughs>